reason that you are here tonight, and I am here, and anybody would spend their Monday evenings, their Sunday mornings, or time like that at church, is so that they can develop a relationship with God and to grow that relationship. So that's why we're here. And in order to do that, we have to know about God and his nature and his will for us. And so we're here to help everyone do that. That's the purpose of the church. It's the mission of the church. Uh, so tonight we're starting with um, something that um, uh, makes sense to start with because it is the very basics of what the church believes. And we say this every Sunday morning at Mass. And if you were at Mass, the 9 o'clock Mass, yesterday morning, you heard everybody say the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And they recited that pretty well. Some of them had it memorized. Some of them had to look at it on the screen. Father Sonny had it, uh, had it in his hand because they changed the translation of it a little bit and he hasn't memorized that yet. But all Catholics will memorize this. And this creed comes from the year 325, and there were creeds before that that summarized the basic beliefs of the church, the most fundamental beliefs, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. But before I start talking about that, I just want to do one thing for you. By the way, if you need a Christmas gift, um, and somebody's asking you, what should I get you for Christmas, there, I have a couple of suggestions. One might be the New American Bible, the Catholic version of the New American Bible, okay? And the reason why I say the New American Bible, there's a red letter, there's a red letter version where the words of Jesus in the New Testament are in red letters, so you can easily find them. That's a good thing. But another reason that the New American Bible is the one to have is because when you go to Mass and you listen to the readings they are this translation instead of some other translation. And it is in modern English. If you ever heard or read uh, from the King James Bible, uh, and uh, some churches use that exclusively, uh, then it's kind of confusing because it's using very old English that sometimes is hard to understand. But this uses modern English, so it's easy to understand. And it's the same translation word for word that you'll hear at Mass. So that's, that's the primary reason for it. A secondary reason is uh, that it has a concordance built into it. In other words, it has an explanation of what the meaning is built right into it. So if you're reading a verse that you don't understand, you say, well, I wonder what that means. You could probably go to the same page and look up that verse and see what the meaning of it is. OK, um, and we're going to talk about scripture uh, in other sessions. Uh, in fact, in the next section session next Monday is an introduction, an introduction to sacred scripture. I'm very interested in that because I am also teaching that very course for a Catholic university online. And it's a brand new course that I'm developing uh, for this university. Uh, but anyway, that's the topic for next, next uh, week. So I think having a new American Bible would be a great thing. Uh, and uh, another thing to have is the catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, and because... This is a summary of everything that the church teaches. And they have a larger one. Uh, this is the small one that I use because I carry it around. And the large one is just too big to even fit in a briefcase. Uh, but uh, you might not read this thing uh, cover to cover. Uh, a, a theology student does. I have. Uh, but... It's a very, very good reference because when you wonder about what does the church teach about anything, you can find it in the catechism. It is the best uh, summary of what the church teaches on every topic. Uh, and so that's good to have as well. But I want to tell you that Jan and I have been away for the last two weeks because we were on a Mediterranean cruise. 
And we were on this cruise with an organization called Catholic Answers. Their website is www.catholic.com. It's a fa fascinating website to visit because their, uh, their mission, their goal is Catholic apologetics. And now the apologetics meaning not apologizing for being Catholic, but defending the faith, explaining the faith. They have a show, um, a radio show on EWTN, which is a, uh, a international Catholic uh, channel, and also on Ave Maria Radio, which is another one. I, I get it on Sirius Radio in the car, and I listen to their show, Catholic Answers, every single day. It's on it's from 6 to 8. And people call in and they ask questions about the Catholic faith. Catholics call in, and especially non-Catholics call in, and they get answers from experts on the air, and you learn a lot. I even learn things by listening to that, because I said, well, boy, that was a great answer. And we had some of my favorite people on that trip. Carl Keating, who's the president and founder of that organization, and Patrick Madrid, who's the author of about a dozen books, at least half of which I have read. Uh, I've got a picture of Jan and I with Patrick Madrid, and I'm real proud of that because he's one of my heroes. Anyway, we did a lot of things, and we went to some of the most significant places uh, in antiquity. And one of the places that we went uh, was in Athens, Greece, and um, uh, we found the place, the Acropolis, where Paul went when Paul visited Athens. And he walked around in that town and he noticed that there were shrines and temples to a lot of different gods. There was a god for everything that the Greeks had. There was a god for wisdom. There was a god for beauty. There was a god for victory. You name it, they had a god for it. And they had shrines and temples to these gods in their big meeting areas where the, uh, uh, where the, the leaders, the, the, the local government would meet, or parliament, or whatever you want to call it, uh, where the theater was, where people would go for entertainment, uh, and where philosophers would go, where the schools were, uh, where the commerce was, where people would meet, uh, and where these temples were. So anyway, Paul went there, and we went there too. And the guide, who was an expert in archaeology in that area, uh, told us exactly where this place was. Now, you couldn't tell exactly where Paul was standing, but by what we have as far as the evidence of Scripture, uh, we could figure out that this was the area and he probably stood here so that he could be seen by everybody. So we had a young priest, young, I'm probably in his 30s, uh, uh, with, with us, and he volunteered to be the one to do it because one of us was going to do it. Either I was going to do it or Patrick was going to do it or he was going to do it. One of us was going to do it is to get up and stand in the place where St. Paul stood 2,000 years ago and say the same words to whoever's listening. All right. And so this is what the speech was. It's in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. The book of Acts in the New Testament uh, was written by Luke. Luke, who, read, who uh, wrote the Gospel of Luke, that particular, that, he wasn't one of the twelve, but he was a good writer. Some uh, traditions have that he was a physician, uh, and he was writing to the Greeks, you know, so he, and, and so he was writing what he had learned from the oral teaching and preaching that was handed on by the apostles. We call that, it's called in Greek, the kerygma. That's where the faith really comes from. That's where the New Testament came from. The oral preaching and teaching of the apostles as they handed it on to the next generation. And one of those people were Luke. He wrote his gospel, and then he wrote the rest of the story. And that's the book of Acts. What happened after the resurrection? What, how did the church grow, the infant church? All right, so here's... Paul's speech. 
And I just imagined him standing there as Father Eric was standing there. And he screamed out as loudly as he could. And about 200 people were gathered. And he said, you Athenians, I see that in every respect you are very religious. For as I walked around looking carefully at your shrines, I even discovered an altar inscribed to an unknown God. Now the Greeks did that because they had a God that they they made up for everything. And in case they missed one, they had an altar to an unknown God, just in case. So anyway, Paul goes on, What therefore you unknowingly worship, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all that is in it, the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in sanctuaries made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands because he needs nothing. Rather, it is he who gives to everyone life and breath and everything. He made from one the whole human race to dwell on the entire surface of the earth, and he fixed the ordered seasons and the boundaries of their regions, so that people might seek God, even perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from any of us, for in him we live and move, and have our being, even as some of your poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since therefore we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divinity is like an image fashioned from gold, silver, or stone by human art and imagination. God has overlooked the ignorance of the past, but now he demands He demands that all people everywhere repent because he has established a day on which he will judge the world with justice through a man he has appointed. And he has provided confirmation for everyone by raising him from the dead. Speaking, of course, of Jesus. So he was proclaiming Christ to them, proclaiming a God that he knew, a God not fashioned from gold or silver or stone. Now, he didn't do well in that area. And the reason he didn't is because the silversmiths and the people who made these images of the gods made a living by their art. And they protested against, uh, against Paul. Uh, so in some places, the church grew quickly. In some places, it grew less qu- quickly for one reason or another. But we thought, and, and I'll tell you some other stories as we go along uh, about that trip. But it's just great to walk in the steps of St. Paul or to go to Jerusalem or someplace like that, walk around the Sea of Galilee in the footsteps of Jesus and the apostles themselves. If you ever get a chance to travel it to that area, uh, take advantage of it. Okay, well, I got off the topic with that. And, uh, and so let's, let's start with, uh, with the creed. What we're going to do is just go through it piece by piece. And you'll have, by the end of this evening, by 8.30, you'll know the fundamentals that the church teaches about who God is, what his nature is, what his plan for salvation is, what his relationship with mankind is. Uh, and what the church is, okay? Because the creed is about all of that. One of the reasons that we have these creeds, all right, and I hope you can see, um, if you're not in a good place, can, I, I hope you can see that, because I've, I've got to stand here to get into the, uh, uh, the picture. In fact, Ken wants me to move over. Hmm? Oh, and you have it on the sheets too, so that's good. All right. Well, in the early church, one of the missions that the church knew it had from the beginning is to keep its teaching about God consistent, consistent with the kerygma, the oral teaching and preaching of the apostles. They heard Jesus firsthand. They traveled with him uh, and ministered with him for approximately three years. And they handed this on to the next generation. Okay? And so um, it was important to keep the teaching about Jesus and about God and about this good news, this gospel. Uh, 
it, it was important to keep that, um, uh, to keep that consistent. And so, from time to time, people started teaching things that were inconsistent with what the church taught from the beginning, and they were called heresies. And the people who did that were called heretics. And sometimes somebody starts teaching something inconsistent with the original teaching and the church has to come together, uh, all the bishops and the pope, they just came together in what was called an extraordinary synod in Rome. It wasn't all the bishops, so it wasn't an ecumenical church council, like which you'll, you'll hear about in a minute. Uh, but it was a gathering of hundreds of bishops um, uh, who got together to discuss uh, a current issue and advise the Pope who will then uh, write an encyclical or a doc document about what the issue. Well, this just happened. That ended just, just Friday was the last day of, that, of the synod that took place. Now, it continues next October. Uh, but the first session is over. Anyway, at the time, in the, uh, in the second and third centuries, beginning of the fourth century, um, there were some heresies, and I don't want you to have to know or remember all of them, um, because there are so many isms that it can get confusing, confusing. So I'm just mentioning these three because these were the three most important of them, most common. One was adoptionism. This was, these things were Christological heresies. Christology is the study of the nature of Christ. Christology. Uh, and so adoptionism said that Jesus was human in every way, but because he was more righteous than anyone else, God appointed him to be his son sort of adopted him, okay? That is a Christological heresy because from the beginning the church taught that Jesus is divine. He's human too. He's both human and divine. Fully human, fully divine though, both. Not human and simply more righteous than anyone else. So that was a common heresy uh, at the time that someone started to teach. Uh, another one was docetism. The second one I have listed here is docetism. And that was kind of the opposite of adoptionism because that said Jesus wasn't human at all, but merely an illusion. He appeared to be human. He only seemed to have flesh and blood and only seemed to suffer and die. That is also uh, inconsistent with what the church taught from the beginning um, that Jesus is fully God, fully divine, and fully human at the same time. Okay? Fully human, suffering and dying like we did, experiencing everything that we experience except sin. Okay? All right? And then the largest of them and the most... Uh, the most widespread of them was Arianism. Arianism said that Jesus was the Son of God, but he was and is sub subservient. He's less than God the Father. He was created by God the Father and therefore not fully God himself, or at least not equal to God the Father. Okay? Uh, that was the, the uh, most widespread uh, heresy. And so um, the church called a council, uh, the Council of Nicaea in the year three, um, 325. And the result of that council was what we call the Nicene Creed. That's why it's called that, because it comes from that particular church council. It was the first ecumenical council. By ecumenical, it means that every bishop was there. All the bishops of the world, at that time 318, attended the Council of Nicaea. All right? So, from its earliest history, the church has summarized its core beliefs in these 
form of creeds. The Nicene Creed was not the first creed. There was a creed before that called the Apostles' Creed. It is very similar. In fact, the Nicene Creed is taken from the Apostles' Creed, and the Apostles' Creed is called the Apostles' Creed because it is said to have been uh, developed by the Apostles themselves and handed on. Okay? Uh, in some churches and at certain masses, masses in particular for children, instead of saying the Nicene Creed on Sundays, they'll actually say the Apostles' Creed. I, I work at another parish, a small parish in Tekoa, uh, Georgia, one weekend a month, St. Mary's Parish in Tekoa. And I was very uh, amazed the first Sunday I was there with the new pastor that we have now, Father Vincent Sullivan, uh, that when they started to say the creed, I started to say the Nicene Creed, but then I was, everybody else was saying something else. They were saying the Apostles' Creed. Okay. Uh, that is actually older. The Apostles' Creed is the oldest known summary of the Christian faith. Uh, historians date some of it, but some of them date it back to the beginning of the second century. That would be the, uh, the 100s. Okay. But these creeds represent the first and most fundamental truths that we as Christians profess, right? Uh, so the Apostles' Creed was first and the Nicene Creed second. It is the result of two ecumenical councils. There was an ecumenical council in, in the 20th century. What was that? Does anybody know? Yes. And, Vatican II, right, exactly. Uh, so, and most of the time, when there is an ecumenical council, there's a grave reason for it, okay? There is something like these heresies, a misunderstanding. This council, the, the Council of Nicaea, was actually called by the Roman Emperor, Constantine. It was called by him because this these controversies about these heresies were dividing the church. And the church was so connected to the Roman Empire that it started dividing the Roman Empire too. You know? So Constantine said to the Pope at the time, hey, we've got to have a council. Get all your bishops together and let's straighten this out so that what the church has taught uh, and preached from the beginning is known by everyone and we can put an end to these controversies. And so they did. Um, there was another council in 381. It was the Council of Constantinople. That's the modern city of Istanbul, Turkey. We were there too on that cruise. Um, and um, the uh, final draft of the Nicene Creed came from that Council of Constantinople in 381. These creeds existed before the New Testament canon existed. And I go, whoa, what are you talking about? The New Testament is older than that. It is. Every book, all 27 books of the New Testament, were written by the end of the first century. However, the canon didn't exist. In other words, the list of the 27 books, canon simply means a list, the list of the 27 books didn't exist uh, until these two local councils, Hippo and Carthage are two cities in North Africa, okay? St. Augustine was the bishop of Hippo. Well, these councils were the ones who made the final decision on those 27 books that we know, know now as the New Testament. And every Christian of every denomination uses those exact same 27 books. But there were at least 50, maybe 52 or 53, books in circulation that could have been in the New Testament, but they're not. Only these 27 are. And when we uh, have our next session next Monday evening, I'll tell you why those 27 books are in there and why the others are not. Okay? But who decided what the New Testament was, was the Catholic Church, and it was in 393 that that was decided. So we had these creeds even before we had the final canon of the New Testament. 
Okay, well, this Nicene Creed is important to us because it's the basics. That's why we're starting with it. It professes our Trinitarian understanding of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That wasn't known before. The Jews didn't know it. Certainly the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, they didn't know it. Um, it is something that nobody could know. It had to be revealed. And so it, it is revealed through the New Testament scriptures. And right, we'll see how. And the creed also professes our belief in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. They are the four marks of the Catholic church. One holy Catholic and apostolic. And on your way out, if you want, Ken's not going to like it, but I'm going to go over here. I'm going to put these over here. This is an article that I wrote about the four marks of the church. So if you want that article, uh, just pick it up on your way out. Okay? Um, those are called the four marks of the church. One, holy, catholic, and apostolic. So if you're ever in trivia and somebody asks you, what are the four marks of the church? You'll know the answer, though they're unlikely to ask that. It's funny, and in, in trivia, uh, and we used to go to one all the time in Snellville, and um, I always complain to people that I don't really know anything except two subjects. One of them is audiology, the study of the ear, hearing, and balance, because I've been in that all my life, all my adult life. Uh, the other thing is religion. So it's either audiology or religion, or I don't know. So people have conversations about other things. Sports, TV shows, movies, novels. And, um, and, and those are the kinds of things that are in trivia questions. So unless you get what on the Bible or something like that, uh, then my ears perk up. Oh, I know that one. Uh, but... Uh, most of them I have no idea. Uh, Jan knows a, a lot of those, but, but I don't. Uh, but, okay, so the four marks of the church, and there's an article over there about that if you want. Okay, if someone was to ask you what are the basic beliefs of the Catholic Church, these would be it. And these are summed up in the creed. That God, one God, we're monotheistic, one God, not polytheistic, which would be multiple gods like those people in ancient uh, Athens, Greece. One God is the creator of all that exists. The universe didn't just spring into being by itself from nothing. It was actually created by this one God, the creator. And this God... Uh, wants a relationship with each one of us. That's called theism. Theism is believing in a God who created the world uh, and, uh, and all living things, including mankind. Mankind's the peak of, of his creation. And he wants a relationship with human beings. That's theism. If you believe that God created the world, but then he just sits back and watches what happens and doesn't have a relationship with human beings, then that's not theism. That's deism. That's a, a different type of belief. Uh, but God reveals himself to us in human history. And we have a lot of human history right here. This is, the Bible is the history of salvation. Okay? Okay. Um, so God reveals himself to us in human history and calls us, each one of us, to a relationship. And everybody here in this room is here because they want to be here. And, they, and you want to be here only for one reason. You want to know God and have a relationship with him. And we're here that, because the church's mission is to help that happen. Jesus Christ is the fullness of God's revelation. He reveals himself in different ways. He reveals himself through nature. He reveals himself through the human mind. He reveals himself sometimes through science. Uh, he revealed himself a lot through scriptures. So that's why we call it the word of God. Uh, at, but we didn't know God fully as far as his nature and his uh, relationship with us and his will for our salvation until Jesus. That's why we say Jesus was the peak, the climax or the fullness of God's revelation about his nature and his will to us. Faith is our response to God's call. 
Everyone here wants faith. If you were at the rite of welcoming, uh, Father, yesterday at the, at the 9 o'clock Mass, Father Sonny asked you, what do you ask of God's church? And you might have said, faith. Uh, because I want to respond to God's call. He's calling me to a relationship, so I want to answer that and say, yes, tell me, help me know you. And to know God is to love God and to enter into a relationship with him. We know from Revelation, from Jesus in particular, that God is a trinity of persons. It's something that's very hard to understand, and there's no one in this room, including me, that, uh, that will fully ever understand this in this life, how there could be one God, but three distinct persons within one God. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we know that that is true because it was revealed by Jesus. Jesus called God Father, and he talked about God the Father. And he even gave examples of how God the Father is. Remember the uh, parable about the son, the two sons, and one son took his inheritance before the father died, and he went out and he squandered it? And then, after he's all out of money, and he's starving to death, uh, you know, he says, well, I better go back to good old dad, um, because, I mean, I'm not going to make it. And so he goes back there. And what does the father do? He sees him coming in the distance and he runs to him and he embraces him. And before he even had a chance to say, I'm sorry, his son, his father welcomed him back and he told the servants, let's celebrate, right? That's the nature of God the Father that Jesus described. He also talked about the Holy Spirit. He told those 12 apostles of his, he said, look, you guys are not going to make it. I'm not staying here forever. I'm going back to the Father. And you guys are going to have to be the church and make it happen. You're going to have to be me for the future generations, you and your successors. And I know you can't do it on your own. And they wouldn't have. This church wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus went back to the Father and sent the Holy Spirit and when that Holy Spirit hit those apostles on the day of Pentecost, that's what changed the entire world. And the church, the Catholic Church, was born that day. So we know God is a trinity of persons. And the incarnation, that means the second person of the Blessed Trinity, God the Son becoming man, expresses the truth that Jesus is fully God and uh, equal to the Father and the, uh, and the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and also at the same time, fully human, except for sin. Okay? All right. So, what does the Holy Spirit do? Now we, we know a lot about Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what actually gives life to each one of us. When we are baptized, we become temples of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit within us. Okay? And it binds us together. It draws us. The Holy Spirit is what led every one of you here tonight. Instead of uh, sitting home watching the game, which maybe you'd rather do, uh, you're here listening to me. And you, Why? It's because the Holy Spirit led you here. And you might say, oh, you know, I didn't hear a voice or anything like that. Well, maybe it was because of a circumstance, a certain circumstance that you're here. Maybe a certain person prompted you to be here. Whatever it is, the Holy Spirit uses people and circumstances in order to uh, draw us together. Now, some people refuse that. They ignore it. They, they don't want to hear it because they want to they live life the way that they imagine it. They want to try to be happy uh, by acquiring things and doing things. Uh, but those people aren't happy. The only time anybody will be truly truly happy inside is when they become what they're called to be. And we're all called to be Christ-like. And the, we know that man, all of us, human beings, were made in the image and likeness of God. So unless we live in the image and likeness of God, we'll never be what we were created to be and we can't be truly happy. Some of the people that have the most commit suicide 
Now, it's hard to understand, and I'm not accusing anybody of anything. There are, uh, there are diseases like depression and things like that that cause problems. But there are many, many people, even celebrities, even recently that we know, that have been, had despair so bad, they didn't have hope. We have hope because we know God and have a relationship with God. And we're here to build that relationship. Okay, so the Holy Spirit does that. He's the one that gives us our conscience and tells us what's right and wrong and prompts us to do what is good and to avoid evil. Uh, The church is called the body of Christ because we are Christ to the world. Uh, We're a community of believers, right? So these creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed are summary statements about this community's core beliefs. Right. And that's what we're going to take apart piece by piece. Um, I'm going to skip these next two slides because we don't need them. Um, If you were here on the very first night for the introduction to the Catholic Church, that was a few weeks ago. um, Then you saw this slide because uh, these are the fundamentals of Christianity, not only the Catholic Church, but all Christian denominations. believe in these six fundamental things. They believe in the inspiration of Scripture, that uh, the Bible, though it was written by human authors, those authors were inspired by God to deliver a message to us, right? And we're going to talk a lot about how we interpret the Bible and everything next week. Don't miss that one. Uh, But we believe that Scripture is inspired. We believe, as we just said, that God is a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the Incarnation, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ, becoming fully God, but becoming fully man, uh, and born of a virgin miraculously. That's the virgin birth, right? Uh, We believe that he suffered and died And through his suffering and death, he um, reconciled the the separation that had occurred between God and man. There is a consequence for every action. The consequence of sin is death. And by death, we mean separation from God, because God is incompatible with sin. And the history of mankind is full of sin. When we start to walk through the Bible, we'll see the first sin committed by Adam and Eve and the next sin in their dysfunctional family when one brother murders his brother, okay? And so from the very first days of the human race, there was sin uh, and a separation between God and man. uh, And... That, sefer- that separation was atoned for. There was a reconciliation because of the sacrifice of, of Christ. That's what we mean by the atoning death. Jesus Christ physically and historically rose from the dead. This isn't something that's just spiritual. This is a physical, historic, historical fact, the, the resurrection. Uh, and we also believe in the second coming that um, at the end of time, Jesus will come back uh, and, um, and judge the living and the dead. Okay? Um, and so those are those six fundamentals that we have in common with all other Christians. Um, I told the people on the first night about my definition from, for faith. I found it scrolling across computers in a a computer lab at Auburn University uh, several years ago, and I wrote it down and I never forgot it. And it's a good definition for us all to have here tonight that faith is a relationship. That's important. I used to say faith is an attitude of absolute trust, but I changed it. I change it to faith is a relationship because it's a relationship between us and God. A relationship of absolute trust, a fundamental confidence in the power and goodness of God. When I saw that scrolling across the computers in this secular university in Auburn, Alabama, 
I found the director and I said, that's wonderful. How is that? I expected something about the, the football team to be scrolling across your computers. And she said, as long as I'm the director, this is the message I want my students to know and hear. And that was excellent. She is retired now. Uh, but she was great. All of her students loved her. And she was a, de a devout Episcopalian. Uh, but she gave me this definition. I was looking for one. And you know, that kind of faith is the faith that we're striving for. You might say, I don't have that yet. I can't say that I have an absolute trust in, the, in the, a fundamental confidence in the power and goodness of God. I just, but that's what we're here for to develop a faith like that, to grow the faith that is enkindled in us, that has been enkindled in us. So that, this is the faith, the faith that the saints had. And, and faith like that is not passive, it's active. It inspire, inspires us. It inspires us to conversion, uh, to change our ways, to become more Christ-like, right? uh, to be more self-giving. All right, the f first phrase, we're going to go through the creed like piece by piece. Uh, I'm watching the time, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit now. Uh, the first phrase is, and this is a little different because this is the older translation. I should have changed it, but I failed to do that today because we, have, we now at Mass, we use a newer translation. But the meaning is the same, so it, it isn't going to make any difference. It's just a few words that have changed. Uh, but we believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. That's the first sentence of the creed. So what do we mean by that? Well, that, by that we mean that God uh, created everything. Things that we see, like the visible universe, and things that we don't see like heaven and hell. Uh, so, theism, Christians are theists. Theism is our type of theology. We believe that God created everything, seen and unseen, and that he wants a relationship with us. Okay? Um, These are other things we talked about the other night. An agnostic doesn't, doesn't know whether God exists or not. An atheist says he doesn't exist. A deist says, yes, he exists, but he's not going to have a relationship with you and I. A polytheist believes in more than one God. And a pantheist this, uh, uh, ascribes the attributes of God uh, to something in creation. Somebody was asking me just this last weekend what I thought about them letting their children go and watch Harry Potter movies and buy Harry Potter books because they had a kind of witchcraft in them and things like that. That is pantheism. People are flying wands or creating magical, mystical things uh, things that only God could do. The attributes of God are being attributed to man and to objects. Okay, So that is pantheism. Uh, witchcraft is an example of pantheism. If uh, you, you think that you can use a Ouija board or you could use tarot cards or you could read palms, this, this, these are all forms of pantheism. right? Um, and um, I told that person, I think it's okay for a mature Christian to go and see those movies and read those books simply for entertainment, knowing it's a fairy tale and knowing that if one believed that in their heart and soul uh, and practiced it, then that would be pantheism. If one knew that and they're simply, they know it's fiction, it's fairy tale, it's entertainment, then it would be fine with me is what I told the lady. Um, okay. Um, on our first night when we did the introduction to the Catholic Church, we did this slide. This slide, um, even if you've seen it before, is very important because in order to have a relationship with anyone, you have to know them. And the more you love, know God, the more you will love God. So it is important for us to consider how we know God. 
You might say, well, you're trying to teach me something about God. How do you know? How does the church know? How does anyone know the unseen God? Right? Not the unknown God that Paul was talking about, but the unseen God. How do we know? Well, uh, it's good for us to reflect on that. We know because partially it's inherent in the mind of man. People, in general, are born, born seeking God. Almost everyone on earth believes that God exists. They might have a distorted image of God, like those guys that drove those planes into the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. They, their God is not the God that has been revealed to us. Their God is a God of hatred and revenge. A God of death instead of life. Um, so, but it is natural for people to believe in God and seek to know him. That's why uh, 96, and maybe it's a, a little bit less, but 96% of the population of the earth um, believes in God one way or another, even if it's an unknown God. Even if they had to make up those gods like the people of Athens, Greece did. Uh, and give them names for, for uh, various things. Uh, it's natural for man to want to know God. Um, and we know God from creation. When we see the universe, and we see how complex human beings are, uh, the, the peak of creation, if you just go and study the eye or the ear or any organ, you know the complexity of it. And you say, that couldn't have just happened, even if it evolved, okay? There's nothing wrong with believing ev in evolution, but we believe that that was a method that God used to uh, create the final product uh, if he did it that way. Uh, so God is known from creation. He's also revealed through his word in scripture, um, which is the history of salvation, the history of revelation, ending with the uh, the peak of revelation in Jesus. We know that the knowledge of God or faith is a gift, right? Because Jesus said to Peter, when Peter came up with the right answer to that all-important question, the most important question that anybody ever asked anybody when Jesus said to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, when Peter said that, Jesus responded, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Uh, Simon was his name before God changed it to Peter. Uh, uh, Bar-Jonah just means son of Jonah. Uh, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. In other words, you're not, you're not so smart that you figured it out yourself. My heavenly Father revealed that to you. Okay, So this faith is a gift. right? And... God is revealed most completely in Jesus. What Jesus showed us things about God that wasn't known in the Old Testament. That God is actually meek and humble of heart. You know, a completely different God than we see in some places in the Old Testament. God understood more fully in Jesus than was understood in the Old Testament. And that knowledge of God is made known to man in every generation, including 2014 here in Lilburn, Georgia, through the church, right? This is how we know God. So you're in the right place. Okay, so I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What are we saying? God's creative power is the origin of all that exists. God reveals himself to us in a continuous act of self-giving. Let me describe how St. Augustine described the Trinity. He said, God the Father from all eternity poured out his self-giving love, infinite self-giving love, and begot the Son. The Son returned that infinite self-giving love to the Father, and the love between them is the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now that's the way theologians imagine or explain the Trinity. Because of what's been revealed, that's what we know, right? Uh, but God pouring out his infinite love from all eternity, before time even existed, okay? So that's why Jesus is not created. He's still eternal and equal to the Father. 
Uh, it's a mystery. With the, uh, something that we're not going to understand completely in this life. But God reveals himself in a continuous act of self-giving. Giving himself to us. Uh, one of the greatest ways is when he gave us his only begotten son uh, who suffered and died for us. He invites us all to each to a relationship. He loves us with the deep abiding love of a father, a parent, uh, uh, because that's the way Jesus described them to us. Uh, and we discover God in the goodness of God's world. Uh, our faith, we know our faith is developed and mature when we can see God acting in our lives. When we say, that just didn't happen because of uh, arbitrary circumstances. That was the will of God that that happened. Uh, when we see God in our lives, the action of God, uh, then we know we have a mature faith, right? Okay, and then we talk, then the creed goes on to talk about the Son. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, as we said, and then it says, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being. Now we say consubstantial, which means one in being of the same substance with the Father. Through him all things were made. In other words, he was even present at creation. Uh, and this is very strong language. The reason why it had to be so strong, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, is because of those heresies. The church wanted to make it 1,000% clear so that nobody could, could mistake what it had taught uh, from the very beginning about the nature of Jesus, Christology. And so that's why this statement is so strong. Uh, did you ever wonder why in, in the, the book of Genesis, in the creation story, uh, God says something unusual um, I'll read it to you. Um, as soon as I find it. Ah. Then God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Let us make man in our image and likeness. God is talking in the first person plural. This is in the first two pages of, of the Bible. Um, it's the first glimpse we get of God as a community of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image. It goes back even to that. Okay? Uh, okay, so what are we saying about Jesus here? That he is the Son of God, that he's co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's eternal. He has no beginning and no end. And it's hard for us un to understand that because we can't understand eternity. We were created in time. We began at a certain time when we were conceived in our mother's womb. Uh, and we live in time. We don't know anything about, we could study the past when we study history. We know all about the present because we're in it right now. We can maybe predict something about the future. Um, we hope that the stock market will go up instead of down. Um, and we could say, well, because of certain circumstances, this is likely to happen or that's likely to happen. Um, we can do that with time. But we can't understand something that has no beginning and no end because we are in time. God is transcendent outside of our time and space. Okay? Uh, he is one in being with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Um, he's, he's part of that one God. And he even shares creative power with the Father. Huh? Because when God said, let us make man, he was talking about Jesus too, the Son as well. 
And John, when in John's, at the beginning of John's gospel, here's what he says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came to be through him. Without him, nothing came to be. He's referring to Jesus as the Word of God, because when God speaks, he creates. Right? So he shares creative power with the Father. It comes from John's gospel. And what did he do? Well, the reason for the incarnation, the reason he became one of us, is for us men and for our salvation to repair that rift between God and man. He came down from heaven and by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by, um, not by Mary's husband, uh, Joseph, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. Uh, the new, the new um, translation uses the word incarnate of the Virgin Mary. Okay, So we're expressing here our belief in the incarnation. God becoming man for our sake. Okay, There's a consequence for everything. Um, and, um, and so there was no way to resolve this consequence except by the sacrifice that Jesus made. Okay, so this incarnation that we expressed in that sentence says it was God's plan uh, for revelation and for salvation to send his son to us, the incarnation. It was, it was so that God could reveal himself fully and also reconcile himself and us. I. Jesus made all things new spiritually and reconciled all humanity with the Father. And through the mystery of this incarnation, God becoming man, Jesus is one of us, yet he was also God. And that's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me because he is our path of salvation. He's our way to the Father. The incarnation. And then... The creed goes on to say, for our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea at the time. Judea, the southern part of Israel, where Jerusalem is. Right? So he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate had to give the order to crucify him. Uh, the Jews couldn't do it. On the third day... After the crucifixion and death of Christ, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures because that had been um, prophesied even in the Old Testament. And after he rose from the dead, he ascended back into heaven where he came from and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and he will come again at the end of time um, in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom... Um, which we're in now, this is called the age of the church, um, will have no end. So that's, that's what this next section of the creed expresses. And we're saying here, Jesus suffered and died for us. Through him and only through him are our sins forgiven and we're given that gift of salvation. We can't earn our own salvation. We couldn't say enough rosaries. We couldn't go to enough masses. We couldn't do enough novenas, um, we couldn't do anything to earn our own salvation. Uh, Jesus is the only, the only way we were able to obtain salvation, the only means of reconciliation. And he rose bodily from the dead. He reigns now in heaven with the Father, and he will return in the second coming, not at the rapture, Right? The truth about the rapture is there is no rapture. But at the end of time, uh, Jesus will return. Uh, and he'll be the judge of the living and the dead. That's what we call the general judgment. Uh, we'll talk about those things in other sessions. And this kingdom of God will never end. It transcends time. Okay. So sometimes people say, well, why did... God do it like that? Why did Jesus 
the second person of the Blessed Trinity, have to stoop down and become man? Why did he have to be born into poverty, misunderstood and mistreated? Why did he have to suffer a terrible death? Uh, why did God do it like that? Why didn't he use some other method of reconciling the problem between mankind and himself? Could he have done something else? Yes, but he didn't. Why did he do it like this? Well, I thought about that a lot. And I came up with these five reasons. And they're good reasons. One of them is to show how much he loves us. That he would do that for us. Uh, to prove how much he loves us. To prove his infinite self-giving in every possible way that we can imagine and know as human beings and more. His infinite self-giving love. To also give us a perfect model. Um, someone that we can relate to. We, uh, Jesus was a visible human being. He spoke the common language of the time. Uh, people could understand him. He had the same feelings, uh, suffered the same things that we did. Uh, and so he was the perfect model for us. When we say as baptized Christians, we, we need to be other Christ. The imitation of Christ is one of our goals. It's a call to holiness. We had to have a model, uh, a perfect model, and Jesus was it. If you know the Old Testament, you know that all the other models were nothing like perfect, okay? King David wasn't perfect. Moses wasn't perfect. Um, you name them, they weren't perfect, all right? The only one was Jesus. Also, so we would learn the effects of sin, if you watched Mel Gibson's movie about the death and crucifixion of Jesus, then you really saw what it was like. He did a great job of representing what it was like. And anybody who saw that movie, if you haven't seen it, get it and watch it. Because um, then you really know the effects of sin. What um, sometimes we think, hey, it's nothing. Well, look what it did to Jesus. Um, and so that we would know God as a father, a brother, a sister, a friend. The God that's transcendent, that's beyond our time and space, actually becoming one of us so that he could be known to us uh, in a way that, in no other way that was possible. And that, so that he would know how we feel. So that God knows what it's like to be human, what it's like to be hurt what it's like to have your friends desert you, uh, what it's like to be scoffed at, rejected. Right? So I just thought I'd share that with you. So most of the creed talks about Jesus, and if we summarize everything that it said, well, Jesus announced to us the reign of God. The first thing he says in Mark's gospel is, uh, repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm here now, all right? I'm going to reconcile things. You're going to now be able to have an intimate, loving relationship with God himself, right? Uh, so he announced the reign of God. He showed us glimpses of the world that God intended for the, from the beginning, a world that was full of love, truth, mercy, Communion between people and, and between people and God. When, when the Pharisees dragged a woman that was caught in adultery into the temple and in front of Jesus and asked him, hey, what are we going to do with this woman? She was caught in the very act of adultery and according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned to death, right? She should be killed right now. What do you say? And Jesus answered them by saying, all right, you know the law, but any of you who is without sin, you be the first one to throw a stone. 
So they all one by one dropped their stones and took off because they know that they were sinners themselves, right? Jesus was demonstrating the love, the mercy, and the goodness of God uh, in situations like that. So he gave us glimpses of the world that God intended. And he invited us to help make that kingdom come, to be Christ to others um, as we're called to be. Uh, he, re- he revealed the Father's justice, his healing and his forgiveness. Uh, he revealed the Paschal mystery that life actually comes from death. It's because of the death of Christ that we live eternally. And in baptism, in baptism, we spiritually die to sin and rise with him to new life. Okay? Um, and I give this scripture passages. You might sometime want to look those up. In the few minutes that we have remaining, we'll cover the rest of the creed because it goes pretty quickly. It spent most of its time on Christology because that's what all the heresy and the confusion was about. Uh, So it goes on to say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, like we said. Um, And with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, and he has spoken through the prophets. Okay, He inspired the um, authors of uh, of the scriptures. So what are we saying there? Well, God, the Holy Spirit is God too, like the Father and the Son. Uh, he, the, that Holy Spirit was shown very powerfully at Pentecost. That's when the, uh, the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised the apostles actually came uh, and empowered them uh, to be what they were called to be, the first bishops of the church. Uh, that same spirit that we saw at work on the day of Pentecost uh, is the same spirit that we have today that binds this church together and calls the members of the church together. Uh, it's, it's what inspires us to do what we do. Uh, it, it's the reason, the Holy Spirit is the reason that the church exists. Otherwise, it would have been snuffed out by the Romans and the Jews long ago. It would never have made it past the end of the second century, if that far. Uh, the Spirit is who reveals Jesus to us, right? When Peter gave that answer, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, it was the Holy Spirit working in him. And it also gives us uh, life and sustains the life of God within us. It's the voice of our conscience within us too. Okay? Um, Okay. So it animates us. It makes us do. uh, What did Paul say when he was talking to the people of Athens? This God is everything. it's, It's our... He's our life. We live and move and have our being in him. What's he talking about? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what prompts our conscience to do what is right in every situation and avoid evil. If you had no religious training, let's say you had absolutely no catechesis, your parents never taught you anything about what is right and what is wrong, you would still know in your heart of hearts that it was wrong to hurt another person physically or emotionally uh, or psychologically. You would know that it is, was wrong to kill somebody. You would know that it was wrong to steal something that's not yours from someone else. You would know that because that's the human conscience. It doesn't exist in anything else in creation except human beings, and it's because of the Holy Spirit. Um, and by choosing to live in the Spirit, in other words, cooperate with that Spirit that we've been given Uh, because we're temples of the Holy Spirit if we're baptized, right? By choosing to live in the Spirit, cooperate with the promptings of the Holy Spirit, this creed that we proclaim is actually a creed that we live. And it's not just words. It's just not in one ear and out the other. So when you're at Mass, and if you're there for the creed, you might see it a little differently now. 
The creed ends by talking about the church. So this is the last part of our discussion on this. And it says, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. That's the final uh, phrase of the creed. And what we're saying there is Jesus commissioned these apostles of his, that inner circle of 12. Uh, and he said, go make disciples of all nations, not just the Jews. Go to all nations. Preach the gospel to all of creation, uh, is the way Mark puts it in his gospel. And John, in John's gospel, John recalls Jesus saying to the apostles, as the Father has sent me, so now I send you. And then he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathed on them. And he said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain them, they are retained. He gave the apostles that, uh, that authority. And he said he would be with, with us, with them, and with the church until the end of the age. Right? So this is the commissioning of the apostles. This is the beginning of the church. Jesus established that church. He came with full authority, the full authority of the Father, and he conferred that authority on Peter as the leader of the apostles and on the others. And the Lord continued to confer authority on other men as the apostles finally realized that Jesus was not going to return in their lifetime. Evidence is that originally they thought that. And so they started ordaining others as presbyters and bishops and deacons. Presbyters are what we know as priests. Uh, and so certain elders took leadership roles. And the Bishop of Rome became recognized as the leader among bishops or the Pope. Because he was the direct successor of Peter himself. Who was the leader among the apostles. Right? the one that Jesus singled out for leadership. All right? When we get to that, we'll prove that to you from Scripture. Okay, so we have the four marks of the church. We don't have to say much on them. Remember, I have an article over there that I wrote on that uh, that you can pick up. Uh, we say that the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic. Here's what we mean. Jesus intended one church. He didn't intend 35,000 churches. There are 35,000 Protestant denominations. We can only name, I can probably name 10, right? Uh, but there are so many divisions of things and, and uh, that it ends up being in the tens of thousands. But even Paul said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. The church is one because it has one doctrine. You won't hear something different taught at another Catholic church, like you would hear maybe a different theology taught from one Baptist church to another Baptist church. You'll hear the same thing, actually, from me as you would hear at Christ the King when you were there for the RCIA, because it's the same exact teaching, and it has been consistent through the centuries since the original oral preaching and teaching of the Apostles. The same moral teaching, the same morality. We're going to have two sessions on Christian morality. The same authority. The, the bishops that we have today trace themselves directly back to the apostles. The same visibility. The church was always seen in Rome. Uh, the same 2,000 years of history. Not different histories of different denominations. Uh, and... We recognize one baptism. It's something we have in common with our Protestant brothers and sisters. The church is one because God will, wills that there be one church. In fact, Jesus prayed for that. In the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, we hear him pray to the Father and ask the Father by saying, Father, as you and I are one, may they also be one in us. He prayed for unity. And the early Christians prayed for uni unity too and understood how important it is. 
in Paul's letters to the churches that he founded in Philippi, like his letter to the Ephesians, or his letter to the Galatians, his, all of his letters to the churches he founds, he tells them to be united, uh, to be one in mind and spirit and teaching. Right? Uh, the church is holy. Uh, now, has the church always done the right thing? Is its history perfect? No. If you know European history, you know that because the church has human beings in it, there have been abuses. Um, the church isn't perfect. But it, and it renounces triumphalism. You know what triumphalism is? It's like, um, it's like me saying, well, I'm better than you guys because I'm Catholic and you're Protestant. Okay. Uh, that would be triumphalism. And the church renounces that. And it tells guys like me, never ever profess that. Never proclaim that because we renounce triumphalism. The church is more of a hospital for sinners than it is a resort for saints. Okay? Uh, that's because Jesus said, hey, I have come to save the lost. I've come to save sinners, not those who have no need of repentance, even though there is nobody like that. Uh, so the church, even though it's holy, um, it is full of sinners as well. That's why it has the history it has. Um, but the holiness of the church is evident in the lives of many of its members, especially if you read the lives of the saints, uh, you, you see a lot of holiness. And the majority of priests and bishops and deacons are holy, dedicated people dedicating their lives to uh, to God and to the church. And the church promotes that type of life. They, the church asks some people, people like priests and nuns, to give up everything, give up family, give up everything, and live entirely and completely uh, for God and God alone. It promotes that. Uh, the church is holy because it belongs to Christ. Christ instituted the church when he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will found my church. Um, he came and died to cleanse that church. The church is apart from the world, right? Paul says that, be in the world, but not of the world, okay? Be different. Uh, the church is actually sometimes called the sec second sacrament because the fundamental, the most fundamental definition of a sacrament is a visible sign of God's invisible grace, okay? Well, if that's so, and St. Augustine is the one who said that, if that's so, then Jesus was the first sacrament, the first real visible sign of God's invisible grace, grace's blessing or favor of God. Uh, so the church is the second sacrament because now the church is Christ here in the 21st century. Uh, Christ is present in the church through the, through the, uh, through the church's people. All right? Thanks. All right, the church is Catholic. Catholic we see way back, I have this book and I'm going to recommend it to you, The Faith of the Early Fathers. It's what the people of that next generation, guys like Ignatius of Antioch, what they wrote and said. And when you read that stuff, you go, boy, is that Catholic. Uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that a lot. But uh, the year is 110, the first time we have written evidence of the church being called Catholic. 110, all right? The Apostle John just died a few years earlier, and the church is already called Catholic, right? It's meaning universal. All the churches that were founded by the different apostles, and a lot of them founded by Paul in different places, in Corinth, in Rome, and uh, Philippi, all those places, uh, those churches uh, all together were Catholic, universal, right? And the church, unlike others, is universal. It invites all races, all all classes, all nations, the church is a worldwide family. You will find the Catholic Church in every nation. And it comprises not only the people alive on earth, but we believe, because we say this is a church militant. There's also the church victorious because they're in heaven already. And we, uh, when we get to it, we'll talk about this state of purgatory. Um, 
that there might be some people who haven't made it to he- have died but haven't made it to heaven yet. They're on their way and they're in a place called purgatory. Well, that's part of the church too. Uh, so that makes it even more Catholic, more universal. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm good. The, the other things. Uh, um, I'm going to mention apostolic. Every bishop, this is what we mean by apostolic, every bishop can trace who ordained him, who ordained him, who ordained him, and if they go back through history, they would trace themselves back to one of the twelve. Remember, Judas isn't one of the twelve that I mean. He committed suicide, the one who betrayed Jesus, but he was replaced by Matthias. Okay? Um, and so... Um, That's what we mean by apostolic, founded on the apostles, their oral preaching and teaching, the church that they started, uh, and our bishops are their successors. All right? Um, And so I could only end by saying the church is today, in 2014, here in Lilburn, what she has been called to be, the sacrament of salvation. Um, the means to develop and grow a relationship with God until the end of time. That's why we're here, folks.